Colleen, you ready to come up? Yeah. Okay, we'll bring Colleen Fahey Rush uh, from Viacom Media Networks up to um, introduce the panel. All right, um, can you hear me if I stand here? Is my mic on? All right, um, well, our last panel of the day is called Harmonizing Cross Media Metrics. Um, before I start, I just want to thank Jane. This has been an incredible program. Um, I think every single topic and every, every single speaker has been incredibly relevant. Um, and it's been a strong afternoon and really strong attendance as well, um, if also a little chilly. So um, uh, I think all of our panelists are now mic'd up so you guys can come on up. This is the dream team, I'm going to say that, um, for a topic like this. We have Artie Bulgren from ESPN and Kate Serkin from Starcom MediaVest and Greg Farrow from AT&T Mobility and George Ivey from the MRC. Um, now, this, you know, arguably this topic is sort of the very reason that Sim was even born. Um, so I think it's fitting that we have the dream team to review um, sort of where we are now. And uh, w what we've asked each of them to do is prepare a few slides so that you all know exactly where they stand on the topic, um, what some of the challenges are that they're tackling right now, what their priorities are. Um, we're going to kick this off um, with George Ivey from the MRC, of course. Um, and I think we're going to try to make up just a couple of minutes of time here because we're running a little bit behind. So without further ado, George Ivey. Great. Okay, we want to respect the, and there's probably traffic to the airport. Whoops. So, uh, thank you and thanks, Jane. This has actually been terrific. Great program. Thanks. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the MRC's perspective on this issue. We're in the middle of a lot of work in this area. That's kind of an understatement. We're buried by work in this area right now. Both the MRC staff and our members, we're pretty much killing them with meetings after meetings about this topic. So what I'm going to talk about are some of the major steps. So this is kind of half how MRC views the issue of cross-platform and cross-media and also our priorities and thinking on the matter. So um, I'm going to talk about the major steps, some of the details, try to give you some real information about things that we're looking at, and then sort of the tools and resources that are available to you in this area from SIM, 3MS, which is really, I don't think has been mentioned much today, but, but I'm going to mention it for a couple of seconds, and us, and then our next steps. Uh, Level setting, we use the term cross-platform some, sometimes, we, we use the term cross-media sometimes. We view those as different terms. But regardless of how you set the definitions, one thing that's been very clear uh, and communicated to us by many constituencies is that the priority is to straighten this out for video first. Uh, from all measurable sources, uh, we get that from everywhere, and uh, we're sort of trying to take action on that. Um, so it's easy. We've just spent a whole day talking about how to do this. So I'm going to I'm going to pile on a little bit, and I'm going to boil this down for you. Uh, it's three basic steps. The first step is to gather the data that you're using, transactional data. We've heard Nielsen, we've heard Comscore, we've heard Joan Gilman, we've heard a lot of people up on stage here talk about getting sizable data sets of transactions uh, and using them. The first thing you need to know is it isn't that easy. You have to understand those data sets, what all the fields mean. You have to sort them out. You have to clean them. You have to assess the quality and completeness of those data sets. Then you have to adjust the data sets and compensate for missing items in the data set. And those can be quite significant. That's the first step in the process. Gather your data. Second step is figure out what you're going to do with it. You're going to integrate it. You're going to start to make decisions with it. So there's a lot of work associated with that. First thing you need to do is figure out how to attribute audience, because these transactional data sets typically don't have audience data associated with them. You have to look at that process. You have to make sure it's a good process, and you have to make sure it's accurate for all groups. For example, children. They can be very, very difficult groups to attribute data. Um, you need to associate that data across the platforms. 
and across the data sources. And then you need to use a process to create unduplicated audience, which is a very complicated process and an area of science that is emerging in our industry. Uh, there aren't a lot of perfect answers for that. Then you have to report the cross-media audience currency, and one of the key areas of that is to decide on what UE you're going to project it on, which is an area of industry debate, but we're sort of coming down on, let's just use total population of the U.S. if we're going to be using these far-reaching cross-media data, cross, uh, media data sets. So that's about setting up the impression data, but you should know that there's more. At the bottom here, on another day, another <laughs> panel, maybe the fifth annual meeting, we can talk about measuring engagement attributes. We can talk about mapping the data to outcomes, because you've heard marketers say they care about sales, ROI, things like that. So for now, we're just talking about impressions and how we can deal with that. But we've got to move further than that, understand that's a priority. So now I'll give you some examples. Unless you've been under a rock, you've heard about the, traffic, the uh, topic of invalid traffic and fraud in digital. This is just a slide that lists the different types. So this isn't about how to do it. This is just the names of them. <laughs> You've got you know, data center traffic all the way to hijacked devices, mad malware, ad adware, fals falsified viewable impressions. There's tons of these things. This is an extremely complex area, very large and difficult task in digital. The industry is aligning around solving this problem. Digital practitioners, the MRC, various parties, there's a lot of work going into that right now. But just know, if you're going to use transactional data, any of, any of it's digital, you've got to sort this stuff out of it. If you don't do that, you're in peril. Then you also have to clean that data. Another big priority of MRC has been viewable impressions. We have to make that data compatible with other media platforms. So we've been implementing viewable impressions for desktop, which is an opportunity to see standard. Again, for another day, we're going to be talking about engagement. But right now, we're just talking about creating impressions. Um, we have to add baseline metrics to that to make these impressions measurable in a way that's consistent <coughs> across platforms. Consider completeness and quality of that data. Are all browsers included? Do you have all the apps? Has everybody implemented your SDK that you care about? All these types of things. So this is a difficult area too. Jane asked me to spend a second on mobile viewable impressions. It's a priority that's unfolding at MRC to set standards for mobile in viewable impressions. If you take away anything from this particular talk, you should take away that setting standards for mobile viewable impressions is going to be difficult. Mobile doesn't work the same way. You have a large swath of the devices where you can't operate flash. You have totally different communication protocols in mobile devices from desktop devices that are set there to conserve power. So we can't communicate constantly about viewability decisions. We have to change the way that works. You don't, you informally in mobile, you could rely on there being a single focus state. Basically, what's in front of you is the only thing that could be in front of you. But now, mobile is evolving where you can have tabbed browsers and hidden content. So, so this is much more becoming like a desktop viewability decision without the tools to do it. In-app is a totally different story. We have to figure out how to make the viewability decision work in apps. Uh, when it comes to figuring out whether the space of the ad is viewable, the actual face of the video or display ad, the technology is not really there yet to say even whether 50% of the pixels are measurable. You still have iframe issues, some of which you can't solve because you don't have flash. Uh, sometimes, if you've ever been in an ad and, uh, in an app and you click on a picture and it looks like a window opens, you're in an HTML page. So you might think you're actually on the net and not in the app. You can't even tell whether you're in the app or the net sometimes. You also have no cookies in that environment, which isn't particularly important in viewability decisions, but it will be later when we start talking about assigning audience. 
cookies are important in audience. We've talked about return path data pretty extensively today. Um, just know it's extremely difficult to use. It's extremely valuable, but it's very difficult to use. You have to understand how the source arranges the data. Is it second by second data? Do they cull out any tuning events that are less than 60 seconds? There are MVPDs that do that. So that's obviously not the same type of data. Look at the granularity and understand the fields. You've got to account for a whole host of things like on and off state of the set-top box, clock alignment, time shifting, VOD, ghost records, other spurious content that you've got to sort out that you think might be viewing, but it's not. And then the collection cadence. Many of you guys that work with Nielsen, you're used to overnight ratings. Well, collecting data from set-top box on a regular cadence of overnight doesn't work well. So, because set-top boxes aren't designed to be measurement tools. Um, you have to project things you don't have, like over-the-air households. I haven't really heard much about over-the-air households today, but they're still important. There are a lot of Hispanics in those households. There are a lot of people we care about that are OTA households. Uh, I don't want to en end up in front of another congressional hearing, so we're going <laughs> to account for them. And we have to complete, uh, consider the completeness and accuracy of that data. What's covered? Jim Spaeth, I think, asked a question about what do you do if you have one or two MVPDs in a market and that footprint is incomplete? Is that a measurement issue? Well, based on our view of the data so far, we believe that's a measurement issue. Um, you have to scale and weight that data. Uh, so this is a complex area also. Then you have to integrate. And this is a whole laundry list of integration things that you need to think about. The quality of the source data, Gerard did a whole paper. Ins ensure minimal underlying ascription in that data set. You have to build links data links to do the integration. You have to set the model priorities and how you do it. The sufficiencies of the donors and recipients, something we haven't talked about today is very often we have these great standards of truth, cross-media panels and things like this, but they're small. So you have a 1,000 households that end up qualifying in your group to ascribe or build your assumptions off of, and now we're projecting that to three and a half million households in a market. You, it's very difficult to ascribe something from 1,000 or 2,000 households all the way up to a million, two, three million, four million, ten million households. Very difficult work. Um, so, and then validation is critical. Standards of truth, doing that on an ongoing basis because the population changes. So, if you haven't been scared already today, you're probably scared now. <laughs> I think Gerard said we're going off a cliff. This is some example. I'm going but to the falls, I think is what he the said. The falls, right? yeah. <laughs> um, relevant materials and help. The good news is we've had five years of SIM. They've been doing a lot of work. The very cross-media focused forum. They've written definitions. Excellent work there. White papers, guidance, thought leadership. Their asset tagging pro uh, project is very, very critical. Uh, if you don't know Harold, get to know him. Uh, and we have a bunch of resources. For many years, we've been working on this. We have data integration guidelines that date back many years. They're still highly relevant. We wrote a whole slew of digital guidelines, return path data processing guidelines. All of these things were written, the return path data guidelines were written in 2013. They're there. They're still good. We actually just reviewed them and challenged them. On the horizon for us, invalid traffic, we have a standard coming out in Q2. Mobile viewable impressions, we believe we'll have that done by the end of the year. We have a lot of thinking to do on there. Incidentally, I have 3MS next to several of these things. This is linked with a project that we're working on called Making Measurement Make Sense. It's a very, very important project. Uh, we're doing digital and cross-media audience-based currency standards, also hopefully by the end of the year. And then some of those other things that are for later, they're actually scheduled to be addressed in standard setting activities. So there's a lot of work on the horizon. Call to action. 
whatever you're developing, start auditing it. You've got Blueprint, start auditing it. You've got Nielsen, total it up, start auditing it. Have it validated in a real, comprehensive way, exposed to MRC members. Please, that's my ask. Because this stuff isn't as easy as it looks, and I don't think anybody's even been telling you that it's easy. It's hard. So anyway, that's my part. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, George. <laughs> All right, so it's hard because it's hard. We have the good fortune of a couple of different industry organizations shepherding important projects. Um, some progress has been made. I was in the back room, so I wasn't able to see the near Jerry Springer-esque panel that preceded us. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Artie, um, who has some slides that might look a little bit familiar because um, I think the challenge remains the same. And while progress has been made, it is still the same. And, it, and it, so I'm going to turn it over to Artie now. Yeah, so I didn't uh, create a, a presentation. I took one out of the file. Um, <laughs> this one, and Jane or Marzina, somebody took the date off. That was the whole thing. But anyway, this is, this is a presentation when asked the same presentation was, was from the first um, uh, Sim Summit back in 2012. Um, and I was talking about cross-platform metrics, what we felt at ESPN were the right metrics. And my point was that many things change, but the math doesn't. Um, and uh, we had touted then, as we tout today, that um, it's three simple things that we need uh, for media, uh, whether it's within a media platform or cross-platform, it's how many, how often, how long, which of course equates to things like reach, frequency, and time. The point is, this could sort of oversimplifies it, but if we can measure those three things effectively, and I would stress time as being probably the most challenging one, uh, we can get to what we need in terms of understanding cross-platform uh, behavior and impact. Um, now back then, one of the questions that we were attempting to answer was, is cross-media usage a zero-sum game? Um, and with these metrics in place, and at this point in time, this is 2012, this is 2011 data from, uh, from GFK at the time, actually it was Knowledge Networks, it wasn't GFK till afterwards, um, that measured this on a biennial basis. Um, and of course, with solid measures of reach, duplication across platforms and time across platforms, we were able to answer this question is that in fact, media use is not a zero sum game and that additional media choices actually add incremental time to the base choice. And in this case, very little, if any, cannibalization to television um, for those people that are using multiple media. All of that additional media was occurring in what we refer, we refer to as at the time of uh, new markets of time. Um, Fast forward to 2015, now we have Project Blueprint, a more passive hybrid approach to measurement. And uh, this is ESPN data, this is not total markets data, but you see the same sort of pattern, right, in terms of what this looks like. Media use is not a zero sum game. In the case of ESPN, the more platforms being used, the better. In fact, it's better for television in terms of the time being spent. Very, very valuable. None of this could be answered without those fundamental measures uh, and insight that we could have used. And if you think about, for those of you who have been in the, in the business for a long, long time, in the 90s, when, when digital came on the scene, we were very, very fearful of cannibalization of television. We didn't have these insights to make us feel a little bit better. There would have been a lot less stress in the industry. Um, so our measurement goals at that time in 2012, in terms of business implications on the planning and the posting side, first in planning, we needed great measures to understand behavior. So when you're planning, whether it's for an advertiser or planning even on the media side for a proposal, you need to understand behavior because that changes continuously. Um, how big is the audience? And is it driven by users? Is, is it driven by usage? Is it driven by net reach or, or by time? Uh, we need insights in terms of where and when this media, these media platforms are being used. And of course, those insights can drive mix and weight of a particular, pl of a particular plan. On the posting side, we need measures of impact. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind there is exposure because there is no advertising impact without effective exposure. Um, uh, did we reach our target audience? Did we reach it effectively? And then with the impressions that we delivered, how did we get there in terms of, uh, was it reach? Was it frequency? Did we reach our reach and frequency? Did we uh, uh, accomplish our reach and frequency goals? Which, pri which, by the way, are questions across platform we can't even answer today. Uh, maybe very, very shortly, though. We're getting very, very close. This is the kind of question that we were hoping to answer, right? If I, 
if I you know, did, uh, uh, bought a schedule of a million impressions, how did I get there? Was it high reach, low frequency, moderate reach and frequency, or low reach and high frequency? Again, questions we simply can't answer today. So billions and billions of dollars being spent on advertising, these are questions that simply need to be uh, you know, answered at the end of the day uh, from an advertising perspective. And so today, this is kind of what we're, well today, this was 2012, but still today, if we have a million impressions, this is what we have, right? This is all we know, and really what we should know is this, right? In simple terms, this is what we're after. And then one last point to make is the value of an age-old metric, which is average audience, average minute audience, which is really a function of reach and time. And it's an elegant metric when you think about it. It's a rating at the end of the day. It's a rate of usage. And very, very important for predicting impressions for advertising, which is why it was created in the first place. And this is an example which we apply to digital now. At ESPN, we evaluate our digital platforms using average, audience, average minute audience so that it's comparable to television, so we can understand how our total media look like. We don't have that net reach part just yet. We're getting very, very close, but this is a, a measure of evaluation. So here we have site A and site B, and one delivered 50 million uniques, the other 30 million uniques. But when we look at it more closely and we look at time, we see that site B uh, had engagement of, more than, of about three times site A. At the end of the day, the average audience of site B was nearly twice the size of site A. What does this mean? It means when that 15 or 30 second unit runs in a linear piece of video content or uh, as a pre-roll to VOD, site B is going to deliver more impressions at the end of the day. So it could be deceiving. This is why we need metrics like this. And it's very simple. It's how many, it's how often, and how long. Great job. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so now we're going to turn it over to Kate, um, um, who, of course, is at Starcom Media Vest. And she's going to be covering, um, she's going to be tackling how they're thinking about not just exposure metrics, um, which has been you know, sort of the, the main lane that we've been talking about for years, but also what's, what's, what's quickly become a huge topic, um, which is using big data uh, to get more into custom segmenting and targeting and, uh, and how she's working with media companies on that. Okay, so um, just to set a bit of context, um, I know it's important that we think about cross-media reach and frequency, but if you think about the broader context of our world and the consumers we're trying to reach, we can see that business and marketing models are breaking every day. If you just look at the brands who've been able to go from zero to completely changing categories in the last few years, Twitter, uh, Netflix, Airbnb, those kind of categories. So we as advertising um, you know, stewards on behalf of our clients need to just reevaluate the way that we do our marketing. We think about the faster, more connected consumer. I don't need to tell everybody in this room here. Um, but I think what that drives is the ability to use that data in a much richer, more aggressive way to connect with advertisers. And I, I don't want to just simplify it down to reach and frequency, because that's, that's important. There's much more opportunity in data than, than um, I think that allows us to look at. So um, you know, it, we think about all of that, but then we think, oh my god, what did my reach and frequency do across my campaigns? So um, we need to take a step back and start to measure some of those things. If we sit and wait for the industry to deliver all those things in platforms, you know, we'd have been fired by all of our clients years ago, and that's not acceptable. We have marketing campaigns and consumers to reach and brands to build every day. Airbnb is one of our clients, and, and they certainly operate in a world that's so real-time, so focused on connecting consumers and pushing their brand out around the world you know, ASAP. So, so you know, it's absolutely critical to set that context. So hopefully people can see that more clearly than um, that looks on some of the big screens. Um, we try to break it down into three different areas. What do we need to think about when we're planning those campaigns to reach consumers? What do we th need to think about when we're negotiating um, an in-campaign to make sure that the money we're spending is optimized during that time and, and in upfront negotiations and all of those kind of things? And then at the end of it, did it work? How do we think about attribution? How do we think about how each of those exposures connected to make that full campaign and push a consumer along the journey to, to have a relationship with the brand. So in planning, you know, the idea of process and context metrics is important. Reach frequency, time spent are critical. How do we balance that with the cost of advertising in those places and the impact? 
and what's the role for the consumer and the role to start to create an experience within that platform. I think we don't just think about media vehicles, but we think about platforms, particularly something like an ESPN um, or an NBC Olympics. What we're trying to do is engage with consumers during that platform, not just expose them. Um, and clearly, the idea of richer targets beyond demos is, is important to us across most of our clients. When we're in negotiation, you know, something that's been brought up a lot today and over the last few months is the idea of transparency and trust. Um, and then thinking about viewability on top of that. We build a lot of the metrics and the um, uh, you know, d numbers that we'll base some of those negotiations on in the terms and conditions that we uh, trade with, with our media partners. Um, and the other thing that is important at that stage of the process is the speed at which data can be returned back. We've all experienced with the digital world um, you know, more real time than, than TV post buys or print execution post buys and those kind of things. So, so speed is critical there as well. And if we think about the evolution of currency to a more outcome and value-based currency um, and some fast indication of impact for that ongoing optimization. And then when we get to the attribution stage, you know, obviously exposure is critical. As Artie said, if you don't expose somebody to a commercial, they can't possibly be expected to act on it. But then the idea of frequency, if I think back to what Conagra have learnt, um, the ideal, you know, it goes back to the old world of three frequency is important. So if we can't measure those three frequencies across platform, we're never going to know. So that's critical there. Um, and there, the idea of expanded audience segments um, is absolutely um, the way we need to measure some of those campaigns against, not total audience, and the ability to link um, that data set to other data sets. Um, and today, if we think about where those data sets come from, many, many different places. Um, we at uh, SMG have our TARDIS product, which effectively does what Megan showed on the last page of her presentation with all of the different connected data sets looking at reach and frequency across all of those platforms. We have our PACE panel, which in the US is based on the touch points uh, data set that SIM brought to the marketplace and Reality Mine now um, have uh, continued to expand in the US. And we do many, many custom studies. We have relationships with Axiom and Data Logics and NCS and, and all of the different data providers that exist across different industries and categories. Um, in terms of negotiation and in campaign, it's the old favorites. It's Nielsen and Comscore there. We do use short form surveys. Um, they're not ideal, but they're helpful for fast response. We've started to use lots of Twitter uh, data and um, social data from Facebook and, and Canvas to help us understand how and why campaigns are working. And again, link to data sets from NCS and IRI um, are helpful there too. We wish those would be available at a faster speed though for in-campaign optimization. And then looking at attribution, obviously Comscore, Nielsen, DoubleClick, Vindico, um, DMP and our run acquisition um, from SMG is helpful for the attribution phase. That's person-based and device ID-based um, tracking uh, within the DMP. Set-top box integration of uh, both aggregate and disaggregated data. Again, data logics and Axiom and, and those different data suppliers. Um, very happy to see Gerard's um, review. That's going to be helpful. We know that data is not perfect, um, but we can't wait until it is. But his white paper will help us continue to improve the, the access and, and the relationship with those data providers over time. Um, Colleen had asked me to look a little bit about how we think about programmatic and, and you know, the split between how we allocate our budgets to programmatic and to premium content. Um, what are their metric needs? And to be honest, many of it is, is the same as, as the traditional um, way that we think about planning. Obviously, audience data and trust are a little bit more critical at the planning phase. Um, but as we go into programmatic, we soon find out whether you know, the idea that we trusted this one data supplier and whether they turned out to be any good or not because we see the results. So it makes it a bit easier. Um, and then the other da uh, data points are more or less the same. I wanted to show quickly a couple of charts that um, show some of the data that we've used in some of those budget allocation decisions. So this first one is work that's been done integrating linear TV and addressable TV against richer targets um, and looking at what the mix of, of addressable to um, linear TV is, should be at whatever budget level for the maximum reach. We have response data and sales-based data for these two campaigns as well, but I won't be showing that today. So again, it's not perfect, but it's better than what we had before, and it starts to give an indication to our clients of how much this, they should be um, 
allocating to different kinds of more data-driven television. And then the second one is just looking at uh, a study that we did a meta-analysis across programmatic budgets. This is display data, not looking at uh, video, but we'll be repeating this analysis shortly for video. And what you can see here is um, for a number of different brands what their investment in programmatic impressions was versus native and premium. And then the KPIs where we saw significant uplifts across those different brands. What overall, I think what we saw was at the upper level of the funnel, more investment in um, native and contextual, and at the lower end of the funnel, more investment in programmatic. Not surprisingly, but these are uh, you know, things that we're gonna continue to do over time to make sure clients are, have the best advice uh, for those allocations. So I will hand Great to job, thank you, Kate. All right, so now we're gonna turn it over to Greg. Um, and then after that, we're just going to open it up for questions and discussion, and, and uh, definitely want all you guys to jump in. I'm relying on you. Well, thank you. Uh, we've seen some uh, great detailed presentations this afternoon that uh, really get into the nuts and bolts of the issues that we have to address. And I thought that uh, rather than uh, going over uh, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing inside AT&T as an advertiser, that instead I would uh, spend a moment to uh, take you through some of the key high-level considerations that we have about what matters to us as buyers, as advertisers, as brands. And you know, if I could boil it down, I'd say that there's five key considerations that I walk around with. One is that we have to be able to manage reach and frequency across our most important media, okay? While there's many other things that we're trying to accomplish, this is blocking and tackling core to us. And I do say across our most important media because uh, while we would certainly like to be able to have everything perfectly detuned across all media, the reality of it is there are certain uh, media which are going to be more important to us. Uh, hint, hint, video across all media matters a lot, okay? Secondly, speed is important. You know, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, if you're not able to deliver an answer quickly, you're dealt out of the game. Timely reporting really matters so that we're able to manage our campaigns in flight, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean real time, okay? But something that gets close to real time, something that is timely enough so that uh, we can really action upon it. Third is really uh, something that I think we're all in violent di agreement about. We have to be able to have common metrics and terminology across all of our media. Uh, otherwise, uh, it does become a big uh, uh, tower of Babel. Fourth, we have to be able to keep it simple. Now, what do I mean by, sim by simple? It's really three things, okay? One uh, key thing here is that we don't like things that are going to be opaque, okay? We need to be able to have transparency. Secondly, it's very important that we make sure that we have something that's not over-modeled, okay? Um, very often, it, uh, uh, we look at information that might be based off of very, very scant data, which is then uh, over-modeled into this uh, Frankenstein creation. And that really becomes the junk food of media measurement. We don't like that at all. And then third, uh, it's very important to have crisp communication. As you can see, this is, we're dealing with very complex uh, uh, topics here. But it's in extremely important that we're able to easily uh, communicate to C-suite individuals what we're, what we're accomplishing and what we're able to deliver. And then finally, we have to be able to keep this affordable. There's lots of ways that we could uh, design a space shuttle, uh, but that's not what, we, that's not what we're able to uh, pay for. So those are just uh, some uh, five principles I'd like to just serve up to you to keep in mind you know, when you're wondering what are the brands thinking, what are advertisers, what are buyers uh, considering right now. And just some other thoughts on how we need to act and what we need to prioritize. Uh, sometimes the question comes up, okay, should we be focusing more on uh, media measurement or ROI measurement? I don't really view it as binary, as either or. They both matter. They both matter a lot. But I would say that ROI measurement solutions are not just going to stand still and wait for multi-screen media measurement to get solved. 
We're moving ahead. We're plowing ahead with ROI measurement solutions. We've had them, uh, and we're improving upon them, okay? And uh, that's just one thing I want to make sure that, um, that uh, you really understand. There's a lot going on with improving ROI measurement using big data solutions from several sources. Secondly, mobile really is a big honking deal. That probably sounds a bit self-serving coming from <laughs> AT&T. <laughs> what can I say? But, uh, but uh, taking off my AT&T hat and looking at from the vantage point of a brand, of an advertiser, um, I see just how important mobile is, not just for driving our own sales, but for when I have conversations with other uh, brands, understanding how it's driving their sales, it really matters a lot. And the industry must really be able to better understand and define and speak about it using common terms. It's not enough uh, just uh, to be able uh, to uh, keep with the status quo on it. Good grief. I mean, sometimes uh, when we talk about mobile, we find out that we're saying different things. Is it uh, what we bought, what was delivered, okay, what's in, what's out? We have to be able to uh, really get crisp about this. Um, you know, sometimes perfect is the enemy of good, okay? Uh, we're not going to be able to reach perfection here in the near term. And uh, sometimes it can be difficult, particularly for advertisers and for agencies, okay, to want to uh, tolerate uh, imperfections in solutions. I suggest it's <coughs> important for advertisers and for agencies to be willing to suck it up make do with a solution that is mostly right and work on making it better, okay, rather than just uh, staying away. Um, I really like this notion of cooperate and agitate. Um, it's important that we're able to uh, be able to come together like this, uh, that we're able to uh, figure out ways of developing common solutions. Now, I've got to tell you guys, I get so tired of walled gardens, okay, so tired of, uh, of standalone solutions that, don't, that are not designed to work with and uh, play well with others. It's important that we're able to uh, think about the importance of cooperation across different platforms, across different solutions. And agitation, why do I say that? Because, um, um, because at the end of the day, sometimes you have to break some eggs to make an omelet, okay? Uh, you have to be able, uh, if you reach a point where you're not making progress, okay, to get agitated, to go out there, okay, uh, stand up, sometimes scream a bit in order to get a solution. And finally, embrace technology. Um, one of the problems that I sometimes face is that uh, it's easy for people to become disengaged because their brains hurt because this is so complicated. Uh, we heard Jane talking about the plumbing layer. Uh, we saw that Gerard mentioned uh, the importance of being able to get down into the details, into the nuts and bolts, and really, um, and really kick the tires for solutions. And it's important that we're able to embrace this level of detail embrace technology in order to make sure that things get done. Oh, great job. Um, uh, thank you so much, Greg. I think um, one of the, I'm imagining, Kate, that you guys have a whole spectrum of clients that are on sort of different places in that spectrum in terms of their, um, how aggressive they want to be with going sort of a more traditional approach to planning and posting versus, you know, going full on programmatic. And I was wondering, how, you know, how do you handle advising them? Um, do you cater, are you pushing them all in the same direction or are you really tailoring your recommendations by, for each of your advertisers um, based on their talent, their tolerance or their aggression, um, their experiences, et cetera? Yeah, I would say we talk about it as their data journey, our client's data journey. So how much data do they have in house? How many data experts do they have in house? What's the, you know, level of, of um, legislative challenges that they might face with it. Um, and then do we do tailor to solutions to them. And I think what we're finding is that some of our CPG clients are the most aggressive in data. We'll find the ones who are um, direct response clients have been down this path for a long time. But the ones who are pushing most are the CPG clients right now. 
And it's exciting to work with them because we do have big data sets in CPG that have never been connected to our media data sets in such an aggressive way um, before. That's great. Um, Greg, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, multi-channel attribution and how you're, um, how you're really um, tackling that these days and how you see that changing in, say, a year. Absolutely. You know, uh, we've uh, been doing multi-channel attribution for a while now, and it's really gone through quite an evolution for us. We started off, like uh, many advertisers, with multi-channel attribution uh, focused really just inside the digital realm and understanding how uh, digital media impacted online outcomes. That was a very important initial state for us, and we did that in tandem with uh, traditional market mix modeling and other uh, ROI measurement techniques that we had. But we found it really necessary to evolve from that, and that's why we've moved into a next phase there where we are taking, uh, we're taking uh, media and across all different channels and looking at, at it uh, in terms of its outcome across all different channels of sale. So very importantly, uh, in this next stage of uh, multi-channel attribution, we're understanding both offline sales as well as online sales outcomes. And we have been uh, bringing in uh, other types of media besides digital, okay? Uh, direct is an obvious one. And then uh, for a stage beyond that, we're uh, looking to bring in video. And that's where we're looking to be able to, uh, to go uh, in 2016 so that we've got our most important media uh, baked into a multi-channel uh, attribution solution. Now, very importantly here, uh, we're also looking at making sure that we have the right calibration solutions as well as ability to tie into market mix modeling, which is a great top-down solution which can be properly married up with a bottoms-up attribution solution. And uh, with this, uh, we're looking to have really a state-of-the-art ROI system uh, that uh, helps us not only understand the value of our media, but very importantly can be served to inform us on how our different campaigns are working, uh, how different uh, targets are responding to, uh, different, uh, to different media, as well as different campaign initiatives that we have, and to also get some richer understanding of exactly how we resonate with uh, different audiences. And very importantly, when you put together a solution like that, you're also able to bring in non-media data as well, and that's where things get really, really exciting. So that's sort of uh, where we are right now and what we're looking to do over the next several months. Just piping in a lot of data. Absolutely. Uh, Artie, you guys, are, are you guys at ESPN working with advertisers using something other than um, straight up reach and frequency types of metrics? Are you working with first party data? Are you working with you know, attribution within the ESPN for your advertisers? So we have, um, uh, we've been building a, a first party uh, targeting business for a while. We have, um, we're blessed with uh, a pretty good set of first-party data. We have over 30 million registered users, uh, for which a little we little fancy football, or uh, well, it's a combination of all of the above, based on our our, uh, our digital users. So we have a lot of behavioral data on what they do on our sites. Um, so things like fandom and and sports interest and uh, uh, specific team interest, but even things like are they Hispanic, are they bilingual, etc. And what's interesting is that we do, we've done a lot of work in terms of geo-targeting. Uh, that's one of the number one requests that we get. And when we talk about segmented, uh, 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 targeted data campaigns based on segments, uh, the biggest request there is age and gender, right? <laughs> so we're kind of like Facebook <laughs> in that Ironic. request. We have very good age gender data, right. and that's what's sort of needed in the digital marketplace. And so our plan right now as we build out our DNP is to build on the back of that and so a lot of evaluation going on right now um, in terms of evaluating the right third-party data sets as we do that integration. And um, so we will be learning a lot from Gerard's work, um, as, uh, and we've already discovered a lot of that stuff as well. So um, it, it's that combination. I think at the heart of this, Colleen, is that um, we are a multi-platform company. Television um, is great at driving reach. It's great at driving awareness. It's great at building brands and reaching people in communities, but digital at the end of the day is about reaching people on a more personal level. And this is where I think data-driven targeting is very, very important. And then ultimately, I think we want to connect that the digital aspect of that to the television aspect. 
Well said. Um, I think that we actually have to end this because um, Shelley's got to get started so that he can also then catch his plane. And I feel bad because I would have liked to have opened it up for questions. It's OK. No, we said that you'd start at 5.15, and it's a whole half hour later. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank all of you for your time and attention. Thank you all so much. There's a lot there, and if you hang around, um, they'll be around for the drinks, and I'm sure you can follow up with all of them. Um, an incredible group of panelists, and thank you so much.